In Ridley Scott's new film The Martian, NASA astronaut Mark Watney is left behind, following an evacuation from the Martian surface. He must rely on his wits, ingenuity and determination in order to survive, hoping against hope that NASA can find a way to bring him home. But just how accurate is this depiction of human Mars missions? What about the book it's based on? Or is this just another example of a Hollywood disaster film? To find out, let's take a closer look at The Martian. The Martian is one of very few films that truly endeavours to fill the void in big budget hard science fiction, and for the most part it does a pretty good job of this. It is truly terrific at creating a sense of immersion, with its incredible vistas of the Martian landscape, which when coupled with a relatable protagonist, leads to a profound sense of empathy as he struggles through ordeal after ordeal. Although this could have easily actually been a story about the descent into madness, it's actually surprisingly funny at times, which is helped in large part by Matt Damon's authentic portrayal of the wisecracking and yet simultaneously brilliant personality of Mark Watney, which transitions over excellently from Andy Weir's novel. Throughout the film, you're left on the edge of your seat, when just unexpected situations come out of nowhere, and you're wondering how can Watney overcome the latest obstacle that Mars has thrown at him. And this is one of the things that I really like about the film, that the main adversary is not another character, but the planet Mars itself in many respects. When faced with almost certain starvation, Watney declares that Mars will come to fear his botany powers. Because you know, this is the essence of the film. It's a tale of human ingenuity and the limitless potential of a logical, rational problem-solving approach to circumvent whatever nature can throw at you. It's a natural question to ask though, as to how the Mars depicted in the film compares to reality. Overall, I give the film a solid 8 out of 10 with regards to its attempts at scientific accuracy. It really puts a lot of attention to detail in all throughout the film in many regards, with most of the main oversights being either due to the source material they're working with, or due to simply to practical reasons. So a few of the larger inaccuracies, firstly of course we have to mention the dust storm at the beginning. Due to the lower average atmospheric pressure on Mars than we have here on the Earth, it hovers around 1% and sometimes lower going down to about 6 millibars actually, it means that the dynamical force, i.e. the rate of change of momentum that you can actually impart onto an object through a gust of wind, is substantially less on Mars for a wind of the same speed as we might see say in a hurricane here on the Earth. So that's why we don't see our rovers being blown over all the time on the real world Mars. So Mars, in this regard, substantially safer. However, there are factors that make real world Mars even more risky and more dangerous. Chief amongst them, radiation. This wasn't really depicted or dealt with in the film at all. Mark Watney's habitat wasn't buried at all, so we can only assume that it had some kind of wonder material blocking out radiation at the surface. But again, this could have been mentioned explicitly in the film. And finally, one of the real big things was not making an attempt to depict the reduced gravity on Mars, which is 38% of the gravity that we have here on the Earth. This is, of course, mentioned in the book, so I assume it's just artistic license on the part of the director. Furthermore, if you do become stranded on Mars, I'd recommend against trying to extract water via a chemical reaction with hydrazine. Instead, it might be substantially simpler just to effectively try and bake water out of a sample of Martian regolith using, say, microwaves, because we now know that Mars' regolith appears to vary between about 2 and 5% water by weight composition. So what else is there? Well, if you look at, say, the transit vehicle going between Earth and Mars and then back in the film, the Hermes, there's no real reason for it to be as large as that depicted in the film. People like Robert Zubrin with his Mars Direct plan have known for quite some time that it will suffice for generation of artificial gravity via the centrifugal force just to have two pods with a tether between them rotating about their common centre of mass. This is a general theme in the film, that the first real-world Mars missions will likely be substantially simpler than the Ares 3. For instance, they could utilise 3D printers in order to create replacement parts for the mission. Because for each additional complexity you add to your mission design and each additional system, that is one more thing that can break. 
And in order to prevent single points of failures, you need more redundancies for these systems, which in turn means more launch mass and hence drives up the cost significantly. It is worth mentioning though that Andy Weir is actually abundantly aware of much of what I've mentioned here, and he actually chose carefully what science to depict in the book, and then by extension the film. And if you're curious actually as to how he made these decisions, you can check out the video just over there from the Mars Society convention where he discussed all of these. In fact, if you have read the book, an entire extra layer to the film emerges before you, as it fills in many of the scientific and technical details, as well as substantially elaborating on many of the plot points. In the film, it seems that Watney solves many of the problems a little too readily. For instance, stum almost conveniently stumbling upon the radioisotope thermoelectric generator, without really explaining where this comes from. It is, of course, explained in the novel. So. What I really liked about the book is that it really emphasises the scientific mindset of Watney using his combined botany and mechanical engineering skill set to solve problems rationally and with a very carefully considered approach. <laughs> Mixing in plenty of sarcasm, of course, which is one of the great reasons to go and read the book. Another example where you can miss a plot point, really, is when Watney starts rationing his food supply and yet later in the film eats a full meal. This is explained in the book that Watney actually puts aside a few meals for special occasions, such as surviving something that should have killed me. And so this is just one of many subtle areas where reading the book really enhances the film and gives you a much deeper appreciation of what's really going on. There were a few things from the book that unfortunately didn't make it into the film though. In particular, I felt that the truly epic scale of Watney's expeditions to both retrieve Pathfinder and to reach the Ares 4 MAV site was somewhat downplayed in the film by time jumps forward, which skipped out on quite a lot of important plot details. Indeed, one of the major things actually was that during the final trip, Watney in the book did not have contact with NASA due to a short circuiting accident with Pathfinder which knocked out all communications. This added an entire extra psychological layer to the final trip, because just imagine from Watney's perspective, he had gone from being the centre of the world's attention to suddenly once more being isolated 140 million miles away from home. Watney's brilliance ultimately really shone brightly here, particularly when he managed to overcome a slowly optical depth varying dust storm and his rover capsizing without any assistance from NASA. The conclusion here is really, don't think you've seen it all just because you've seen the film. The book is truly excellent, it's fantastic and I highly recommend you check it out on its own merits. For the most part though, the film does little to alter the material of the book in any substantial way. A few small exceptions that I noticed is that in the book it was actually Doctors Beck and Vogel that carried out the final EVA, as opposed to Commander Lewis, which I, I mean I can certainly see the justification for this from a dramatic perspective, as she did feel responsible after all for leaving him behind on Mars. And there was also the issue that is somewhat controversial of the addition of the final scene back on the Earth. Now I know many people will have different opinions about this. Particularly, one of the things that I would have liked to have seen leading up to this final scene actually, is a discussion with the crew of the Hermes as to the additional radiation they would be committing themselves to when in interplanetary space on the return voyage. Because in many ways, they weren't just committing to be spending extra days away from their family, they were agreeing to shorten their own lifespan potentially significantly, so that would have made for very difficult actually discussions of the consequences with their families back on the Earth. But that aside, I actually quite liked the final scene, because it set the film distinctly apart from much of the apocalyptic and dystopian media that we've seen really dominating TV and movies over the past few years. Here is a tale of a positive future, where humanity has once again dared to venture out into the stars, where risks are taken and those who refuse to give up in the face of adversity ultimately prevail. Or you know, maybe it's just an extended advert for disco music. Only time will tell in the end. But based on all of these considerations, The Martian may have just topped my list of favourite films. So from me, it's an impressive rating of 9.4 out of 10. Thanks for watching, and please do let me know your own thoughts on The Martian in the comments down below. 
This week's feature video is an exploration of the science in The Martian by Andrew Rader that expands on a number of the points that I mentioned. Next up though, I'll be discussing the major implications and discoveries from the New Horizons mission to Pluto, which reached a key milestone this week with its first publication to the journal Science. Be sure to subscribe so you don't miss it.